Hi, everyone. Welcome to our speaker series for leading STEM educators and school leaders. My name is Chris Bennett, and I'm very pleased to be hosting this speaker series event focused on the challenges that are facing K-12 school leaders in preparing young leaders for the fields of tomorrow. Today's session is entitled The Quality of STEM Education, A Comparative Look. And I'm pleased to shortly introduce you to our guest, Prashant Loyalka, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Educa Education at Stanford University and a Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Before I uh, introduce Prashant, I would like to introduce myself and share briefly about Digital Media Academy. My name is Chris Bennett. I'm a longtime video game designer and an affiliate at Stanford Graduate School of Education. I'm also the engagement specialist at Digital Media Academy. Digital Media Academy was founded in 1999 on the campus of Stanford University, and we provide comprehensive K-12 STEAM curriculum and consultation services to global schools and education leaders. Digital Media Academy's leading STEAM schools program provides curriculum covering six subject areas, computer science, engineering, music and media, digital art, business, and game development. The speaker series is brought to you by the leading STEAM schools team and is available globally through the Digital Media Academy schools community. So why are we here? The series aims to connect you with leading thinkers and change makers to unlock the tools and knowledge needed to lead K-12 education change. And just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We invite you to use the Q&A feature throughout the session and we'll have time at the end of the session to take some questions from you. We'll also be sharing the recording of the session with you in the next few days. Without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Prashant Loyalka, our guest for today's session. Prashant's research focuses on examining and addressing inequalities in the education of children and youth and on understanding and improving the quality of education received by children and youth in multiple countries, including China, India, Russia, and the United States. I would like to invite Prashant to join me now on screen. Hi, Prashant. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your journey and how you find yourself where you are right now? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I've been uh, involved in education for a number of years. I did my PhD at Stanford uh, in the 2000s, uh, from 2004 to 2009. Uh, before that, I had actually lived in China for about seven years. I was an English teacher uh, slash uh, entrepreneur slash, you know, manager in different types of companies and really loved the people of China and the culture there. And I came back to the Graduate School of Education. I came back to Stanford. I was here as an undergrad, but came back to the Graduate School of Education at Stanford to really learn you know, education policy and tools that could help me think about how to improve education in China. And so after graduating from here with my grad degree, I went back to China and I worked in Peking University in a graduate school of education over there and also worked with the Ministry of Finance and Education on education policy in China. Um, after that, I came to Stanford once again to do my uh, faculty position here. So I became a fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and then have been, you know, working in the Graduate School of Education as well. Such a fascinating background. Uh, it's been so interesting reading about your, your research. Can you give us a brief overview of your research on STEM learning in colleges globally? Sure. Um, so basically, I've been involved, uh, led a big project uh, that was multinational and assessing and improving skills in college. Uh, mainly among four major countries, China, India, Russia, and the United States. And just to give a little bit of background, you know, we were trying to answer this important question about what kids were learning during college and what was improving student skills during college. And when we talk about skills, we're really talking about two types. One is academic skills, like we typically hear of things like math and science and language in major specific skills, you know, like computer science, if you're a computer science major. Uh, the other kind of skills that was really talked about a lot in the literature around colleges was things like critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, what we call higher order thinking skills, which are what 
colleges think are very important, especially in liberal arts programs, but also employers in the labor market also think are very important uh, for students to acquire. And so in thinking about those two types of skills, you know, we kind of looked through the research that had been done up to that time um, and found out really there are only a handful of studies in the United States that looked at how much students were learning these types of skills. Those studies were relatively small in their scope. They always used kind of a non-representative sample of colleges and students. So we really didn't have a good idea in the United States about what was happening with learning in college. And then when we looked internationally, we saw there were almost no studies internationally. And we can say with pretty good confidence, there were almost zero international comparative studies that actually looked at entire higher education systems and saw how students were doing in different types of systems in terms of how much they were learning academic skills and higher order thinking skills. So the basis for our project really was to try to answer two questions. And the first was to assess and compare student skills within countries, but also across countries, across systems. And in that, we were really looking at skill levels. And what we mean by levels is how are kids doing at the start of college in terms of their math, science, and higher order thinking skills? How are they doing in the middle of college? And how are they doing at the end of college? So just kind of measuring the level at each stage. And then we were also really concerned with thinking about how much are students learning over time? So are they actually gaining in their skills? How much are they gaining? What are they particularly strong at in terms of learning? So that was the first kind of research agenda item that we had. Um, the second was to look at what kind of factors at the level of institutions or the behavior of faculty or what students did or what they did with their peers that would help them to develop these different kinds of skills. Um, and so to answer those two questions, again, we went to these four countries, mainly China, India, and Russia. We did these very large scale surveys and assessments in these countries, and I'll just describe that in a bit. Um, but we had occasional comparisons also with the United States because of our collaboration with the Educational Testing Service, the same agency that makes the GRE and the SAT in the United States. Um, these four countries that we focused on produce over half the STEM graduates in the world in college. So it was pretty nice to be able to look at these countries. And specifically what we did is we were really rigorous about making sure we took a nationally representative sample of institutions and students from each of these three countries, China, India, Russia. And then again, we had some comparative data with the US. Um, when we went to those countries, we focused on computing and electrical engineering related majors which comprise about 30% of all STEM majors. And then we assess the skills of students over time, these academic skills and these higher order thinking skills. And we also surveyed students, their faculty, their department chairs, and really tried to do this type of quasi-experimental and experimental analysis to look at what kind of factors improve student skills. So that's kind of just an overview of, of the project um, in a nutshell. That's really fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what sorts of um, differences you found between the countries from your research. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, you know, in terms of academic skills, we had some really interesting results. Um, one of the things that we found at the start of college is that students in China, and admittedly, these are self-selected samples, right? These are students that make it into engineering, make it into computer science in college. So you can think of you know, that as a sort of background. But when we look at those students, the large pools of them in China, India, and Russia, we see that students in China are way ahead in terms of their math and science skills compared to students in India and Russia. And you know, we know through other studies that students in Russia are comparable to students in the United States. So by extrapolation, we might say students in China are even way ahead of students in the United States in terms of their math and uh, science skills. Now, when we say way ahead, it's like in terms of like sort of the research speak that we use, we, we say there are about 1.5 standard deviations ahead, which means that if you take the average student in India, or sorry, if you take the, yeah, the average student in India, they would be in the bottom 5% 
of the distribution of students in China in terms of their skill levels. Um, so that was one pretty major finding. Um, surprisingly, we found students in India and Russia were at pretty comparable levels in math and science at the start of college, which meant that the subset of students in India that were getting to college were actually you know, pretty high achieving in, in their math and science skills. Um, but then the surprising finding that we find, I think probably the most surprising, is that as we measure those science and math skills over time, we find that whereas Indian and Russian students are actually learning over time, they're gaining new math skills, um, new science skills. We find that in China, students are actually losing the math and science knowledge that they had acquired in high school, and they're not really learning new math and science skills. And so what that does is by the middle of college and then even more by the end of college, we see that India and Russia students are catching up to students in China in these types of skills. So that's kind of one major finding that we had about academic skills. Um, another finding was about the higher order thinking skills. So I'll just take critical thinking as an example. Um, what we find is again, Chinese students right at the start of college have amazingly high levels of critical thinking skills, which I think was surprising to some people. Um, they're about the same level actually as students in the United States. Here we had some direct comparative data with the United States. Both of those countries are a bit ahead of students in Russia, you know, in terms of critical thinking. And all three of those countries are far, far ahead of students in India. So this is an area where India is actually quite weak, whether we're talking about critical thinking or creativity or problem solving. Students in India actually lag far, far behind students in the other three countries um, in, in terms of their higher order thinking skills. The other kind of fascinating finding we have is that just like we saw for academic skills in China, we see that students start to lose their higher order thinking skills over time. So the critical thinking skills of Chinese students are lower at the end of college than they are at the start of college. And what this does is it really reduces the gap or it creates a gap between the United States and China in terms of critical thinking skills by the end of college. And now China becomes more similar to Russia and a little more similar to India in terms of the level of their skills at the end of college. That's really fascinating. Are there any implications for policy based on this? Yeah, no, I, that's a great question. So, you know, we actually talked to policymakers um, in different countries. Um, I think for China, the implications are really stark. You know, um, when you are in China, you're really as a high school student and even as a junior high school student studying so hard and preparing for multiple exams to try to get into the next level of schooling. When you're in high school, you're trying to do really well on this college entrance exam, the Gaokao. And you're hoping that you know by scoring really high, you can get into a great university. But then once you get into university in China, you're almost guaranteed to graduate. Like 99.9% .9 of the kids end up graduating after four years because there's a policy in Chinese universities not to fail students in most of them. Um, so what this does is as students get into college, our feeling is that they don't really have incentives to learn. They've been under so much pressure beforehand, um, but once they get to college, they don't really have any incentive to study hard and to acquire new skills. And so I think that's why we see the skill drop. And the same thing for faculty. faculty by extension, don't have incentives to teach well um, because they're not allowed to fail students or really assess them in an you know, sort of honest way about how much they're learning. Um, the other thing that we talked about with uh, India, India was actually really happy to learn that students were learning at least academic skills during college. Uh, the ministry there thought you know, that's a really good thing because colleges were actually being blamed for the poor level of graduates that they were producing. Um, so employers were saying, you know, these graduates, they don't have critical thinking skills, they don't have problem solving, their math and science skills maybe aren't what we want either. But what we could show is that any of the kind of deficiency you would see in India was really due to what was happening before college. 
in their schooling system, like our so-called K through 12 type of system. Um, and they also took note of those really low high order thinking skills that were coming from the K through 12 system and before. Um, and they really decided, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time on thinking about how to improve skills for kids before they get to college and not put so much pressure on the, the higher education system. Interesting. Thank you for that. Let's go on to a second question. Um, I know we have some good ways to define and measure uh, academic skills, but higher order thinking skills are a little bit new to, to some schools, still trying to figure out that process. What is kind of the best practices of how we define and measure higher order thinking skills like, uh, like critical thinking and creativity? Yeah, thank you. Um, so to be very honest, oftentimes researchers go into uh, their studies, you know, when they do research and they just try to think about what would be a good theoretical definition of something like critical thinking. And so different researchers over time, they have slightly different definitions. And recently what people have been doing is sometimes doing a really good systematic type of review over what have all the different types of researchers and what do employers, you know, through interviews, you ask employers, what do you think you mean by critical thinking skills? So I had mentioned that we work with the Educational Testing Service, ETS, and they had done this really nice type of review about critical thinking and sort of summarized um, and given a definition of what critical thinking is. And what they came up with is that it's really the capacity to evaluate evidence and its use, to analyze and evaluate arguments, to understand implications and consequences, the ability to understand causation and explanation, and the ability to develop sound and valid arguments. So it's actually a set of things, um, but I think each of those elements we can feel intuitively would help us to really think, okay, yeah, that seems like what we mean by critical thinking when we talk about it. And you know, besides doing this kind of summary of, of what research has said about critical thinking, the test that we used in the study I described really tried to measure these types of elements in students as they were going through college. Um, in terms of creativity, that's even more complicated <laughs> uh, because people often have very different ideas about what creativity entails. Um, but one really popular way of thinking about it is creativity is about divergent thinking. You know, how much you can think of kind of valid ideas that are also innovated, innovative and different from other people. Um, and so, you know, our creativity test that we gave to students in these different countries was pretty interesting because we'd give them an object. We'd say, here's like a, a button, you know, that you use to button your shirt with. And we would say, what are alternative uses of the button? And you know, students would write down within a certain amount of time, alternative uses they could think of a button. So it might be like the button could be used as the wheel of a toy car or a Frisbee for a little mouse or something like that, just some kind of out of the box ideas. And we took that data from thousands and thousands and thousands of students and we used machine learning methods and also hand coding methods to try to see you know, which were valid responses uh, that weren't just you know, totally ridiculous or nonsensical. And then also we were able to compare students across each other to see how different their ideas were from other students. Um, so that was a measure of sort of originality or what we call divergent thinking. Interesting, but I'm thinking about, you know, in K to 12, we're preparing students for higher education, but we're also preparing them for employment later in life. And I'm not sure that if you saw this at all, but did you see any differences per country in how employers would define critical thinking or creativity or have ideas about what, what's more valuable than others? Or was it kind of set between countries? You know, I think there's not enough um, research into that. I know what I can say is that employers in different countries really do care about critical thinking and problem solving. I don't know if anybody's gone into great depth about how there are differences in definitions across countries. Um, but it would be a good exercise because I think a lot of times, you know, being having been an employer myself, I think when we say these words, um, we actually don't think about what their <clears throat> definitions are. We assume that everybody knows what we mean when we say critical thinking or creativity. 
Um, but it would be a good exercise even for employers themselves to reflect on, you know, what do I mean by that? There's an interesting one because when we think about reading or we think about arithmetic, there's there are good rubrics that we can lean on for that. And I feel like um, we don't have a really good set of rubrics that we can lean on yet for some of these for some of these um, higher order thinking skills. Yeah, that's for sure. I think we don't really know very much um, either in schooling K through 12 or in college about how to improve critical thinking, how to improve creativity. I know there's you know some very basic efforts. Uh, the OECD had been working on an effort just to measure creativity and to measure critical thinking. Um, they'd also been asking teachers, you know, in different places all over the world, you know, like how, how would you teach to this type of concept, to this type of skill? Um, and I, I think right now we don't really have a consensus on what would be a curriculum that would really help students to, to learn these things. Thank you. Um, next question is, what do we know about what improves higher order thinking skills? Yeah, I, like I said, I think we don't have really a very good understanding of that. Um, there's been a little bit of discussion in the United States um, around the idea of active learning, uh, which is instead of the traditional lecture format where students kind of listen passively, uh, that would be called passive learning, right? That you introduce a greater kind of dynamic into the classroom, either by having more projects or students work in teams by having more of a dialogue that is question-based between the faculty member and the students. So, so those are different you know, things that are all lumped together as active learning. Um, flipped classrooms are another example of active learning. And so there's a little bit of evidence that says that active learning in colleges in the United States in STEM majors can improve academic skills. And there's also some idea that it might improve some higher order conceptual understanding of certain science concepts. Um, but I would say that, you know, probably that's the main thrust of what researchers have been looking at. And outside of that, there's not a lot of great research that's rigorous about what can actually improve higher order thinking skills. Interesting. I know from um, the work that I've done that active learning versus passive learning in flipped classrooms can help um, improve engagement in students. And so it's mm -hmm. good to hear that that even if there's not a direct connection, some of that may be translating to thinking about things, um, growth mindset, um, higher order thinking. What do you think are the, the growth opportunities here? What do you knowing that there's not a lot of research, what sort of research would you like to see around this that would be so helpful for schools? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see that um, we could really start to have large-scale randomized evaluations around curriculum that would try to expressly improve these types of skills. Um, I, I think, you know, we could do even more research on active learning, uh, for example, but maybe define active learning much more clearly um, maybe break it up into sort of different categories like, you know, project-based learning, even within project-based learning to break it up. Um, but also it would be neat to have curriculum that really tried to teach students critical thinking. Um, you know, what would a curriculum like that look like? What would a creativity curriculum look like? How would we integrate that into the normal classroom as well? Um, but then again, you know, especially coming from my research background, I would say that it would be really nice to do these large scale randomized control trials. Um, at least we could start with smaller ones and then build to bigger ones to see if there are scalable ways to try to improve these skills. Thank you. Um, another question, I understand this isn't your focus of research, uh, but can you speak to some of the research about why increasing social emotional learning outcomes is so critical for young people? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, there's been some research by social scientists that talk about the fact that um, whereas cognitive skills, what we typically call cognitive skills, you know, like our um, math or literacy or executive functioning, those types of skills are developed really early on in early childhood, a little bit in primary school, but kind of get set early on. Um, but the other 
subset of skills which we call non-cognitive or social emotional learning, or some people call them personal qualities, are things that are actually much more malleable even into adolescence and into college. And it's those types of skills because of their malleability um, that I think has really aroused a lot of interest among social scientists. Like these are the things that we could do uh, in high school or even in college in terms of interventions to try to improve skills. Again, there's not much literature on that right now. Um, so one thing is the malleability, but the other part is there have been economists that have correlated the learning of these non-cognitive skills, these social emotional learning skills with employment outcomes. So um, over decades, what we can really see is that as time goes on, cognitive skills, while important, are becoming less important relative to non-cognitive skills. So things like my ability to work in a team, which is a really important social skill, is something that as I develop it, I'm more likely to get a better job more likely to be employed and more likely to have a higher salary. And that's a like really clear trend that we can see in the economy, um, that there's this greater payoff to these types of social emotional learning skills. So it sounds like kind of far from social emotional learning being kind of a nice add-on, that really this is something that's gonna be critical for kids you know, as they go through life. Um, when you think about how successful they are in their careers and how long they're gonna be in their careers versus just teaching them the cognitive skills. That's right. And there's this beautiful complementarity that they're also seeing. Um, when I see when they're seeing it, they're using data to actually show this. They're showing that your increased cognitive skills lead to higher wages, your increased non-cognitive skills lead to higher wages. But also when you have both together, you have an additional effect. Um, that there's kind of this interaction um, uh, effect that you get from the two types of skills that you're going to improve even further. So especially if you see somebody who's really good at math and science, but a little bit weaker in the social skill side, by improving the social skills, it will really improve their capacity to be successful in, in the labor market by, by leaps and bounds. How interesting. Thank you for that. So for a final question, we'd like to um, let our panelists kind of open up and really think about the future, uh, be positive if you want to. Where do you see the future of education going from your vantage point? Thank you, that's a great question and a really like amazingly uh, important question. You know, I, I can speak maybe just about a few things uh, that come to mind. So the first is, I think when we think about education, we're going to want to think in the future even more about the purpose of education and convey that purpose to students. Because I think what we're seeing, at least in developed countries like the United States, but even in other countries outside, we see that student motivation can sometimes be very low. Um, and we can also see that there's kind of not necessarily a coherence that students feel as they're going through schooling to the curriculum. They feel like, well, why am I studying this? I'm not quite sure what is you know, really the point. Um, so in terms of thinking about purpose, especially with all of the issues that we see socially in the world today, these global social issues like climate change, um, you know, the spread of pandemics, uh, terrorism, war between different countries, I think students are really interested in thinking about how they can apply what they learn, not only to developing themselves intellectually and morally and so forth, but also towards improving society and contributing to their community. So I think to tap into kind of a twofold purpose where you improve yourself through schooling, but also contribute to society very explicitly and recognize how those two aspects are related and how education can foster that kind of twofold purpose. Um, I think would give a lot of coherence and a lot of motivation to students. So that's kind of one element I think is really important. Um, another element I think is really important is I think you already brought it up really in your question. I think we're gonna spend more time on social emotional learning on these kind of non-cognitive skills because I think in the past we've thought a lot about like how to physically be healthy, how to intellectually contribute to being a good engineer, um, how to build kind of systems. But I think these personal qualities we're seeing are really needed um, in the workplace. They're needed in the home. They're needed in our communities. 
you know, how do we really work together in collaboration with others? How do we appreciate diversity? How do we communicate in such a way that we can come to a consensus? There's many, many of these types of personal qualities that I think are, are really important. Um, I think maybe a third and last thing that I'll just bring up is, I think there's a lot of fragmentation in education today. Um, there's kind of fragmentation around disciplines, especially as you get into high school and then going to college. Um, I think there's a kind of fragmentation around theory and practice. You know, we kind of learn theory and then we forget about practice or something is really practical. We go to vocational school and then we forget about theory. And then also in what we were just talking about in terms of sort of the intellectual aspects and the moral or social emotional learning aspects, I think they're kind of fragmented right now. And I think a big job of education of the future is going to be how do we integrate those things? How do we make them coherent? Um, maybe one kind of framework to thinking about that is to think in terms of capabilities that we're trying to develop in people. And by capabilities, we mean a developed capacity to think and act in a certain sphere with a particular purpose. So for example, I might have a capability to measure things as a scientist, but to measure things well, I need to integrate different things. I need to integrate information, concepts about what it means to be good in measurement, certain qualities and attitudes to be careful and to be thoughtful about what I'm measuring and how I'm measuring it. Um, and so to really like put those together around the actual things that I'm trying to do, the things that I'm actually trying to affect in society. Um, so yeah, those are a few ideas around kind of my wish list for what I hope would happen in education over the next decade or two. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I think your first and your third points really made me think about, I like to think in, in terms of engagement loops and what keeps people kind of moving in a direction and thinking about um, the purpose of education, letting students know what they're learning and why, but also that offshoot of making the world a better place and helping to develop capacity really makes me think about developing higher order thinking skills. Um, Cause I've seen instances of flipped classrooms where students are actually invited to help create their own framework and their own rubrics for class. And instead of just bringing in the examples from textbooks written 20 years ago, they get to bring in concepts that are relevant to them right now, right? Yeah. I think that's amazing. I wish everybody had you as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for this. Um, if you if you don't mind, I'd love to bring in a couple of audience questions um, and hear what they have to say. That would be great. Great. Uh, this one says, thank you, Prashant. You mentioned some countries showed students were more prepared when they started college STEM programs than others. What do you believe may be some of the factors or reasons for university preparedness for students in STEM subjects? Any insights for high school teachers who are teaching in STEM areas? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'll try to answer it in two different ways. Um, just because you asked you know, in the end, what could high school teachers do? And I think that's a really important question. But maybe before that, I think the reasons we're seeing kind of these differences across countries um, is related to so many different factors. Um, so one, you know, maybe sometimes why we see lower skill levels in India could just be economic development. Um, we know that like nutrition, we know that, you know, sort of eye care, vision care, basic health, really does matter a lot for learning outcomes. And I think that in some parts of the world that we were looking and that you know we are thinking about today, when we think about education, they just don't have as much um, input early on. And I think that really does affect you know, the kind of learning outcomes you see by the time you get to the start of college. Um, another major factor is just how much tutoring and how many resources are put into schooling. Um, not just by the schools themselves, but by parents outside of class. Um, and so we know that in China, for example, where we see these really, really high levels at the start of college, we have so much parental input into, you know, spending time for tutors after school classes, the parents themselves are grading and checking the homework, um, and they're responsible to the teachers to make sure they do that. So those are, you know, things that I think are also really contributing. Um, a third thing I do believe is I see in 
China, which is one of the most successful places, there's a lot of kind of decision to be very rigorous in terms of the curriculum. Like when they get into high school or even into junior high, they actually have um, chemistry, physics, and uh, biology for six years, all three courses, right? Wow. So there's a lot of rigor around that. And math is also, you know, of course, for six years, um, similar to how it is for a lot of students in the US. But when they're learning those subjects, I'm really impressed by the curriculum um, that has been created for the students. It's very rigorous, it's very deep. You have lots and lots of practice, continuous practice. Um, but without necessarily feeling like for math, for example, that they have to go into calculus, right? They're learning um, the concepts of say pre-calculus, trigonometry, geometry, very, very deeply until they sort of mastered them. And I think that, you know, is part of what we're seeing um, by the end of college of why we see these differences in skills, at least between China and the other countries. Um, for what a high school teacher could do, I, I actually have to defer to high school teachers very humbly because I think, um, especially if you're a high school teacher and you're asking me this question, I, I think um, there's a lot of learning there that frankly my research doesn't speak to. And, and I, I would say I'd love to hear your thoughts about that rather than my own. Thank you. Um, we have another interesting question here. Did you see any differences across countries in the types of learning experiences that were producing successful graduates? For example, how do you see the role of industry involvement in student learning experience? Oh, that's a really good question. I think across all three countries, we didn't necessarily see a lot of industry involvement in colleges. Um, at least in the four-year colleges that have electrical engineering and computer science related majors. I mean, occasionally we'd go to a college and, um, you know, they would have a program that was associated with a particular company and they would try to produce graduates to work in that company. But honestly, those weren't usually the top institutions. And even among the second tier institutions, we didn't see too much of that. Um, but maybe when, one or two system-wide things that we saw um, that I think were there in India and in Russia is that we did see um, that there was occasional like assessment and testing um, that was happening in those countries in college um, that was kind of impelling students to have to put in more effort and take their studies seriously. I know we're in a culture that really, for very good reasons, doesn't like testing too much. Um, but, you know, just the idea that there was something that was sort of incentivizing or compelling students to be responsible for their learning, I think that was one thing that we were seeing very clearly was helping, um, you know, sort of students learn. Um, another thing is, you know, we did actually also look at some types of health uh, measures. We saw that when students are sleeping more, uh, very clearly they're, they're learning better. Um, so India was one of the worst countries in terms of sleep in college. Um, and we could see that was clearly affecting learning. Um, in China, we saw students were sleeping a lot. Um, maybe they weren't learning in college so much, but the ones that were sleeping more were kind of learning better. Um, and then I think the third thing is, you know, we really are still trying to figure out in the black box what contributes to learning um, system-wide. And I, I think a lot of it's going to rest with faculty and in, in terms of how they teach. Um, and so we see that, you know, faculty effort does make a difference in terms of how much students are learning. What it is particularly that faculty should do, um, we're not too clear about. Um, in those three countries that we did the study in, we didn't find that active learning actually did anything. Um, and so we're a little bit um, puzzled as to what it is that faculty need to do to, to help. Interesting. Um, the sleep part is such a such a critical one. Um, I have a middle schooler and she's dealing with with the, the kind of schedules that you have and and it get up early and already running into some of the sleep issues. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, we have another question here. This is definitely a tough one. Um, how does education keep up with the pace of changes in technology and STEM subjects, whether in college or across the full education spectrum? I am a high school leader, and this is a huge challenge for us. 
Yeah, and I think um, education always seems to be a bit behind, you know, in keeping up with technology. Um, this is despite our best efforts. Um, you know, that's a good question. I think this is my maybe ignorance, but I feel like in high school, um, at least at most high schools, what we're really teaching are these kind of fundamentals in math and science. Um, I think that's one reason why China, again, does so well, because they're really good at teaching those fundamentals. Um, and maybe leaving, you know, some of the kind of newer topics uh, where technology has influence to colleges and not maybe making it, you know, as much about uh, what we have to be concerned with in high school, except for what I think a lot of high school uh, leaders that are really at the kind of forefront do, which is to give a lot of freedom to students to, you know, do projects and explore and sort of themselves, you know, think of, you know, I see all these robotics classes and all of these, you know, challenges to like make an excellent documentary or, you know, to really like think of, you know, ways of changing society through um, the talents and skills that they're learning. That might be a way of kind of incorporating the changes in technology into the learning process. Because I think students, usually we find they're maybe more adept than we are at the latest technology. <clears throat> um, in terms of like thinking about the use of education technology itself, that's another area of my research. Um, I know that's an area of Chris's research as well. Um, but in the large scale randomized trials that we've been doing in different countries, I think it's really a mixed bag to know whether or not to kind of bring in computer assisted learning or these things called adaptive learning or these tools of technology to help improve education in the classroom. Um, we're finding a lot of things just don't work. Um, and so I wouldn't feel a pressure necessarily to bring technology of you know certain types of tools into the classroom. I didn't know if that was part of the question I just wanted to mention. And you know, part of your answer really made me think about what we were talking before about um, giving students more agency um, in the classroom. In this case, bringing their own top technology in. I mean, we know as as adults that um, that students, for the most part, are picking up technology way faster and quite a bit earlier than we are, and giving them the opportunity to kind of showcase this technology, see if it's something that's usable for the classroom seems uh, on the surface like it might um, kind of help that uh, help that initial engagement leading to students getting lit up a little bit more about learning which we know will lead to the higher order thinking skills the academic skills getting excited about being in school um, and the kind of the, the kind of that concept of becoming a lifelong learner which we all hope for for our students. Yeah. Now, that's a great point and really important to mention. I think there's a certain exposure to technology and science um, in terms of like the cutting edge, the innovative things that are happening in the world that students do need. Um, and I think the more they can think about science and technology in relation to these big social issues, these global social issues that we were talking about, I think the more that, you know, that can also uh, interest students and really get them motivated to want to think about science and technology in that integrated way. Thank you. Uh, this is a good question. What is your opinion of the IB or International Baccalaureate? We teach the PYP, which is the primary years program, where we integrate STEAM and units are inquiry based where the focus is on rubrics and the students co-create rubrics. Any opinions there? You know, I, I don't know enough about the system that you use about IB. I, you know, I can only speak anecdotally, really. I have known, you know, students that have graduated from the IB programs. I think they get a really great education. Um, it's really rigorous and thorough. Um, so I don't have anything bad to say about it. Um, it could be that there are much better, obviously, curriculum and systems out there. Maybe yours is one of those. Um, about students co-creating, I think, you know, as a researcher that kind of looks at policy, looks at entire systems, I always think that you have to think about your student population. Like if you're working with really elite students that are motivated to create, motivated to co-create, that there's a lot of accompaniment from teachers, I think that's all great. You know, I think that that can really help students to become even more proactive and agents of their own learning. Um, 
they can really help them be creative and critical as well, as long as they're receiving feedback from the teachers. Um, but I think for a large population of students, and that may not be who you're you know, dealing with, um, that are kind of lower achieving or struggle with motivation, that kind of co-creation may not obviously be the, the thing that they kind of need as their next step. Um, we're getting close to time, but I want to squeeze in one more quick question because I'm just curious about where your research is taking you now. You've talked about where it's been. What are you kind of excited about in the next year, two years, three years? Uh, thank you, Chris. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm really interested in what we were talking about, these kind of personal qualities or social emotional learning, uh, especially for youth. Um, and so, again, I think we have all of these global challenges. And uh, one of our projects that we have in the field right now, for example, is about uh, online misinformation and how students sort of navigate that on social media, on the internet. And so we have a big project right now in India that's trying to teach students both the skills on the one hand, but also the values that they might use to kind of combat this misinformation online. Um, and so we're trying to like kind of see what are the curriculum, what are the program components that would help students develop capacities to be able to navigate the internet. Um, the other kind of you know, project that we have right now that I think uh, is a good example of that is, I think one of the issues we can see in society is this polarization that's happening. Um, we have issues with racial justice. Uh, we have you know, problems between ethnicities. We have uh, issues of gender inequality, of course. Um, so one of our projects, again, in India is really trying to look at how do we build unity and diversity? Um, and this is kind of a really core capacity that's related not just to being a good citizen in your society, but really also related to how you engage with others at the workplace when they have different social backgrounds and you are of different races, of different ideas even. So we have a whole program that we've uh, created over the last year and a half to try to help students you know, overcome prejudice, and discrimination to really see human beings as human beings and work in unity with them, but appreciate the diversity that we have too. Um, and also, you know, sort of another component to think about what does it mean to really collaborate and cooperate with people and how to instill those qualities into youth. Um, it's these kinds of kind of non-traditional educational pathways and outcomes that I think I'm really most interested in in my research, because I think we always imagine that education by default somehow solves these problems that gives us these capacities. When we say, oh, you know, what are the problems of the world and how are they gonna be solved? We say education, but we're not explicit that education then has to be more than just, you know, kind of like rote math and rote science. It really has to see human beings, the youth that we're dealing with as being a really capable um, people who can be the resources and the talent and, the agents of that change that we want to see in society. So what is the education that we have to have to kind of bring out their good qualities so that they want to make that uh, change? Thank you for ending on a note that's so inspiring and positive. I'm, I'm super excited about the, the youth of today and what they're going to create as well. And uh, we've come to the end of our available time today. I wanted to thank you so much for sharing your own expertise with us. Um, I also want to thank again Digital Media Academy for sponsoring this series. You can find out more about Digital Academy for Schools program on the website at digitalmediaacademy.org forward slash schools or contact us anytime at info at digitalmediaacademy.org. On behalf of Digital Media Academy, I'm Chris Bennett. I want to thank everyone who's able to join us today for this session and wish you a fantastic rest of the day. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone.